All right, uh, good morning, everyone. I think we can get started. So today's topic will be what I consider the, the big issues surrounding mobile development. So uh, we already skimped those briefly last time, but today I'd like to go into a bit more detail about what we actually have to deal with. Um, first of all, a bit of organizational stuff. So um, who hasn't yet signed up in Moodle, the password is MIS2016. Um, tutorials will be every second Friday. We already had the first one last week. And I have to apologize because I made kind of a mistake in sending out the notification email before the tutorial. Uh, that came kind of late, so most people actually didn't have Android Studio already installed. So I hope that's, that's settled by now. Um, apart from that, a few general tips uh, again now at the start. Uh, so please do get started as soon as possible on the exercises so that we actually have time to help if you run into any real problems. Um, some people don't yet have a partner for the exercises. That's also what the, what the message board is for. So please do simply ask there if someone's still also without a partner, then you can pair together. And um, some people have been asking what to get if they want a cheap Android device just for development, if you don't already have one. Um, we recommend the Moto E second gen generation. That's important. Um, but it's really, uh, rather low-end device, but it's surprisingly full-featured uh, given that it's just 100 euros. So if you actually want to buy one and you don't have to, that, uh, uh, let me stress that you can do uh, the first part of the exercises just with the emulator. It's not convenient, but it's possible. Um, so we don't want to force anyone to spend any money here, just as a recommendation. Um, and for the second half, for the, for the small project, then we can maybe arrange for you to borrow one from, from our pool or something like that. But uh, yeah, some people have been looking to actually buy one. So if you want one, then this is really a not too expensive option. Okay, so now let's just recap what the, the big topics are which I'd like to address today. So we have a limited power supply, we have limited storage. So basically energy and data storage are both limited. Then we have always wireless communication, which brings its own unique set of issues. Um, we have quite different I.O. capabilities than, than large desktop computers and laptops. We have a different context, or we have a changing context to be more precise, and we have uh, several issues regarding privacy and security. And all of these I'd like to go into a bit more detail today. So let's start with power. Um, we do have a limited power supply. Um, and the, the big trade-off here, and we're going to be talking about trade-offs a lot. The big trade-off is on the one hand, we have energy storage capacity. On the other hand, we have size and weight. And um, so, one aspect is that we could, of course, increase the energy density, but this is something for uh, physicists and, and chemists. So this is not something uh, we can address here. What we can look into is uh, how can we reduce energy consumption. So if there's not so much energy available, then we should, of course, not use so much of it. And um, this is something we're going to look into time and again. So this is maybe not a a uh, separate topic by itself, but it will pop up and again and again. So um, one of the, the important strategies to actually conserve energy in mobile devices is to turn off the big energy consumers whenever possible. And the biggest ones are listed here. Uh, that's, this is not an exact list, of course, but in general, the one thing that consumes the most energy by itself is actually the backlight of the display, or more generally, the display itself. So if you have any way of running, for example, your app without actually needing the display, then you should turn it off. So that's a very simple rule and it will save by far the most energy uh, over the long run. Uh, next biggest consumer is usually um, the wireless modules like uh, Wi-Fi, 4G, 3G, 2G even, in descending order of energy consumption. Um, and stuff like the GPS receiver, the camera, and other sensors, all of these also consume quite a lot of energy. Um, over the long run, uh, the, uh, so over the whole battery 
charge uh, CPU and GPU usually aren't that important because they have very efficient internal uh, energy saving mechanisms already. So they throttle down the, the, uh, the clock, for example, when they don't have anything to do and go into different sleep states. So of course, if you're running some very graphics intensive game, then they will, they will go up in, in energy consumption, but for most general use cases, CPU and GPU aren't that important in terms of energy consumption. Um, so the big, the big idea is of course to always turn off consumers you don't need. Um, and if you do need them for, for a longer period of time, then you can try to at least lower the, the polling frequency. So for example, you don't need uh, 60, uh, 60 measurements per second from some sensor, but maybe you can get, get along with one measurement per second if you're looking for uh, more long-term long data, and then that might also help, help to, to uh, conserve energy. Um, so let's, for example, look at a, at a small graph. So how much, this is, how much energy in total does it take to transfer one kilobyte of data, 10 kilobytes, 100, 1,000 over different networks. So for example, over 3G, over GSM, uh, over Wi-Fi. This one is over Wi-Fi if you include um, um, the scanning for networks and the association. So for this, you have a fixed cost in the beginning that you Need to uh, need to look for networks and actually connect to the network. The lowest one assumes that you are already connected to the right Wi-Fi network. So, does anyone have an idea why uh, the very old GSM 2G, which actually is not much worse in energy consumption than Wi-Fi for small small file sizes, why does it go up so fast for for larger files? Does anyone have an idea? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So it's far slower. So the best you can get out of GSM is, I don't know, 96 kilobits or something if you do channel, channel bundling and so on. So uh, for larger file sizes, it will take far longer than it will take to transfer it over 3G. And for that reason, at some point, 3G actually starts to become more energy efficient, even though the, the initial cost is much higher. But since it's so fast, you can take a lot of data and transfer it in a very short amount of time, and the total energy consumption will get lower. Of course, if you have Wi-Fi, then even if you factor, factor in the, the scanning part, then it will still um, take a lot less energy, and um, you also won't uh, use up any, any data, data caps which the user has. But right now, just looking at energy consumption, um, even if you have a very slow network, which takes very uh, small amount of uh, energy per time unit, then if you use it for a long, very long time, then it will just add up, of course, in the long run. All right. So um, other issue, which is kind of connected, other capacity issue is storage. So the standard is something around eight gigabytes by now, if you get something like the cheap Motorola phone I mentioned. Um, so you can't, of course, have all your data on the phone, or only if you have very little data. If you have lots of pictures, for example, then the usual way is to transfer it to a cloud service. And uh, again, we, we get, get a kind of uh, trade-off, so we um, either need to use bandwidth to access our uh, cloud service, or we need more local storage. And of course, if you have more bandwidth usage, then you also have more energy usage, so uh, these kind of trade-offs also also interlock in some way. Um, so what we have in uh, basically any mobile device by now is flash memory. Um, it's because why? Does anyone have an idea? So why don't we have hard disks, for example? Yeah? Well, it was right, so it's quicker and uh, if quicker, it's exactly. Oh yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point too. So it's of course sensitive to 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 shocks. Hmm? Yes. So you don't have any moving parts. Uh, also a good reason. Yeah. Um, 
Well, it, it depends. In, if, if you have a, a memory card, then you can replace it. So the, the built-in memory in most smartphones can't actually be replaced. Well, in, in technically can, but nobody will do it because it's an insane amount of work. You actually have to desolder the chips and uh, put in new ones. So um, it's, pro it's probably more expensive than to just buy a new one. But of course, you're right for memory cards. So actually, that's we, we have these different trade-offs I'm listing here. So all of these together come out to make uh, to make flash more viable than uh, spinning devices like hard disks or something. That hasn't always been true. So for example, the very first iPod uh, had a very small hard drive, actually, 1.8 inch or something, yeah. built more or less specifically for the iPod. But at some point, flash memories simply started to become more and more economical, and so we switched. So uh, a couple of reasons are listed here. So um, of course, if you simply look at the price per terabyte or something, then hard disks win big time. They're, that's almost one order of magnitude, which you have to pay more if to get the same amount of storage and flash. Uh, but if you look at physical density, then of course, flash wins big time because it's uh, even per cubic millimeter, you can store almost one gigabyte by now. And for hard disks, it's, it's far worse. On the other hand, power consumption also big advantage for flash. So if they're actually operating, uh, so if you're directly writing data to the device, then the power consumption isn't all that different for flash and um, hard disks of similar size. But um, for uh, as long as they're idle, they uh, have far less, flash has far less power consumption. So, um, and actually they are idle most of the time. Of course, you can power down hard disks, for example. So they also consume less energy, but then they take a lot of time to start up. And that's also not something you want in a, in a mobile device, which you want to use very quickly. Uh, it's not, not even uh, most desktop and laptop computers actually power down their hard drives, as far as I know. That's usually only done for servers. Um, yeah, and of course the typical capacity, so if you want lots of storage, then again you need to go for the hard drive, but um, if you're on a mobile device and can make different trade-offs, then flash uh, is, um, is of course the better choice. I think 256 gigabytes is the maximum you can currently get in a micro SD form factor, and that's actually um, a really, really uh, complex piece of engineering. It's like 10 different layers of chips stacked directly on top of each other and then actually sand it down so you can get it into that one millimeter which a micro SD card uh, has, to, has to offer. And uh, once you get that uh, very large, um, very, very high amount of integration, um, then of course you also get Again, one other different trade-off, which is uh, fault tolerance. So in a, in a hard drive, you have very, uh, very clear conditions, basically. So they're filled with helium, and they're at a specific temperature, and the disks spin at a certain rate. And if you don't shake them too much, um, then not a lot will happen to your data. On the other hand, in such an such a extremely densely packed uh, storage device like a, like a flash card, um, you have far more sensitivity to external influences, like if they get a little warmer, then s some bits might start to flip, or if you're, uh, if you're on a plane and you get a little more cosmic radiation than usual, then again, bits might flip, and for that reason, uh, this trade-off involves that you need more and more uh, like uh, error correction capabilities in the flash storage, because it's more sensitive due to the higher density. Okay, so just to summarize, the, the primary trade-off here is uh, size and weight versus capacity, both for energy and for, uh, for storage. And um, this kind of leads to secondary trade-offs. On the one hand, we can turn off consumers to preserve energy. Um, on the other hand, we can use some sort of outsourcing to a cloud service to, um, to save storage or to extend storage. But then again, leads to a different trade-off regarding power consumption, uh, traffic, and so on. Um, okay, well, so far for the uh, first block, does anybody have any more 
questions of, or comments up to here? Yeah. Well, I had a question about that slide with uh, different levels of power consumption for different uh, wireless mm -hmm. networks. And I wanted to ask what about uh, 4G or LTE? How is it compared to all those? Well, I think it's, it hasn't been, been analyzed in this study, but I guess it would be quite similar to, um, to the relation between 2G and 3G. So the initial, initial energy consumption might be a little higher. Um, well, actually, that's an important point. We can discuss that right away when we come to wireless stuff. Um, I will have to see if that study has been updated for 4G. I'm not sure, uh, but I'll definitely check because it might not be as clear cut that it just has higher energy consumption. The um, interesting part about 4G is, for example, that the uh, network cells are smaller. And for that reason, you need, usually need less energy to transmit to the, next, uh, to the next base station. And for that reason, it might actually be more energy efficient than uh, 3G, even, in, even for small amounts of data. But I can't tell for sure. I'll, it's a good point. I'll, I'll try to look it up. Any further questions?